I am André Torre, the president of ERSA, which stands for European Regional Science Association. And I am very pleased and honored to welcome all the participants and the attendees. And it's my pleasure to open and to chair this webinar on COVID-19, facts and debates, the OECD and ERSA experience. And I want, first of all, to thank OECD for this very uh, fruitful cooperation. The goal of this seminar is to present the main results of a recent study on OECD regions and cities at glance 2020 and to mobilize the ERSA expertise in order to comment and to discuss about these incomes. In this respect, we will welcome Paolo Veneri, head of regional analysis and statistics unit at the OECD, and two prominent researchers of ERSA. Alessandra Fagian, professor at the University of L'Aquila in Italy, and Liz Bourdeau Lepage, professor at the University of Lyon in France. And we may comment about the presentation of Paolo. Please, for the attendees, type your questions in the chat, and then we'll do our best to ask the presenters to answer to them after the presentations. So, first of all, now I turn to the first speaker, Paolo Veneri. Paolo, He's an economist, he's the head of regional analysis and statistics units at the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. And his work covers several topics connected to urban and regional development, including the understanding and the measuring of urbanization, well-being and spatial inequalities. So he led several OECD flagship publications, including the most recent Cities in the World, A New Perspective on Urbanization in 2020, and most of all, Region and Cities at Glance, on which this topic is based on. So, Paolo, the floor is yours now. Thank you, André. Uh, hope you see the screen and you hear me well. Yes, very, very well. Yes, first of all, I would like to, to thank you. Uh, thank you, Ersa, thank you all uh, of you, because uh, you have um, you are hosting and you are organizing this, uh, this very topic that I think is, uh, is uh, an important topic uh, nowadays for regional scientists. So how understanding regional disparities uh, uh, in consideration of the, the current times that we are living today, of the COVID crisis and of the, um, the other mega trends that are actually affecting and will affect uh, in, the, in the near future our regions and cities. So that is why the, the, I mean, the presentation of today is, is, is going, where, where it's going in the sense to try to understand and provide a big picture of, uh, on the, the, the changing regional disparities in the long term and in consideration of, of the, the, the times that we are living. So um, I will touch base on, on, on several topics. Um, again, what, what I will uh, tend to provide in this presentation is, a, uh, is a, a global perspective, in a global in the sense at least that I would like to provide uh, the big picture with an international comparative, uh, international comparative lens and uh, looking at different domains of regional disparities from economics, well-being, uh, environment, et cetera. But what I would like to, to highlight is, is putting this, uh, uh, these reflections in, uh, in the context of the, of the health crisis that we have been living now and the other, uh, other important mega trends, uh, such as those that you see uh, represented in this slide, such as digitalization, aging, demographic change, climate change uh, that are actually are, are shaping um, the, the current uh, state of uh, cities and regions. Most of my, uh, of my facts or the charts and the maps that you will see I mean, are uh, related to um, OECD countries. Uh, so it will be a, an overview on, the, on, on all OECD countries, which are, uh, are 37 members uh, overall, but some of the slides will refer actually to even uh, a global uh, perspective when it comes to, especially when it comes to demographic change. Um, so uh, let's start with, uh, with the health consideration as, uh, as it was uh, mentioned at the beginning. Um, so 
uh, by the fact that uh, the COVID crisis had a, a very important impact. So uh, let me just give you a, a brief, um, um, let's say, view on what on what we uh, what we found, what we assessed, what we are able to collect, what evidence we were able to produce on the fact that the the, the impact of the crisis this was in a sense very much place based, in a sense that was not evenly distributed across countries. Uh, it was uh, uh, concentrated in, much, in specific places that were uh, most hit. Uh, this, uh, this slide that you see is a map that uh, uh, of the COVID crisis and it actually uh, shows the, the excess mortality. So the, the, the increase and total number of, of deaths for all causes, not just COVID. I mean, this is total mortality in regions for uh, practically all OECD countries, we were able to collect this information on the uh, on taking the window of the first wave of the, of the COVID crisis from, uh, from February to, to June um, and comparing the, the, the deaths of, in this uh, window, so window of time uh, to the average of the previous uh, couple of years. Um, so this gives a, a sufficiently robust uh, estimation of what could be uh, the impact of, of the of the COVID crisis on, on health uh, across countries because it allows for international comparisons. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't need to count and to test uh, the, the, let's say the, what, how many deaths were related to COVID and where, uh, how, uh, where not. But what we see here is, is the first important uh, uh, pattern is that, uh, especially during the first wave, uh, it was the metropolitan uh, regions that were most uh, affected. We classify, uh, I mean, for several of the slides that you will see, I mean, we classify regions uh, to, in order to provide a kind of a more uh, synthetic picture. Um, we classify regions, especially the, the small regions, what we call TL3, uh, probably in Europe, you are more familiar with the NAS3 concept. It is the same, it's exactly the same. So for the, for the NAS3 region, we, uh, we use, um, we, we, we classify the NAS3 region according to different types of regions. There are the metropolitan regions, there are the regions that are non-metropolitan but close to metropolitan areas, and there are the regions that are more remote. Okay, so if we take the remote regions on average, we have evidence that they have been uh, in the first wave of the COVID less affected by um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of mortality. Um, overall, we see an increase in 6% uh, across the whole OECD space in, the term, in, uh, in terms of total, total deaths. Um, in the OECD area. But how prepared we are, uh, we are the regions, I mean, to face uh, this crisis from the health point of view? I would consider three points. One is the, is the, uh, the, the health infrastructure in place in each country and how they changed. The, the uh, let's say, the um, morbidity rates uh, in, in, each, in each country, in each region, and then also the environmental place-based factors that characterize first, the first point, uh, the health infrastructure. Regions have different types of health infrastructure. We can take a, a different availability, for example, of uh, hospital beds. This is a very simple indicator, but it's an indicator that is available across countries overall. Um, we, the important point here is, of course, we see from this map, this is the, the number of hospital beds in 2018. This is the latest point in time that we can have in this case. So before the crisis, um, and we see that uh, there are differences that are mostly based on countries. But the, the interesting point is how they changed over time. If we take the last 20 years, we see that um, the, uh, uh, the number of hospital beds have decreased on average in practically all OECD countries, but they have decreased as, uh, as you can see from this slide, in a, in, according to a specific spatial gradient. Uh, this also depends from the from the general uh, changing approaches to healthcare, so there are other uh, reasons that uh, are, are related to, 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 to the healthcare systems and the change in organization, of course, in countries. But um, just as for you to, to see that we clearly see that over time there's been a, a decrease in the availability of hospital beds in all types of regions, except in the, uh, in the large metropolitan regions. So there has been a concentration of the availability of these types of health uh, structure across space. This, of course, doesn't seem to be related with the, it is, there is no correlation in, with, the, um, with the excess mortality that we see before, but it's just uh, a, a factor of, let's say, of preparedness that can, can characterize regions. Another, um, 
In other aspects uh, is, the, uh, is the morbidity and mortality rates by disease uh, in countries. Here, um, I mean, we collected in, in our report, I mean, several indicators of this, of this type. And you can see this is another um, uh, elements that is connected to health and, and the preparedness of the, of the regions that can show very, very high uh, regional variation. Um, if you take obesity, for example, just to make an example from this slide, um, we clearly see that in, in, in non, some non-European countries, the problem is, is, is much more uh, important. Obesity is more prevalent, but the difference across regions can be, can be quite high. And we know from the literature that actually even the impact of COVID can, uh, is higher uh, when it affects uh, population that is already that have already pre-existed um, let's say uh, challenges and therefore uh, this is something that also to uh, to be considered when it comes to the preparedness of regions so the, the population the characteristics of the population but then uh, let me come to instead a factor that uh, has recently been um, found to be strongly correlated with the, the impact of COVID and is the, uh, the characteristics in terms of environmental quality, in particular, the, uh, the pollution of the air. Um, here we estimated uh, indicators of PM2, or concentration of PM2.5 in all uh, metropolitan, in all, in all functional urban areas, uh, so that means cities and their commuting zone uh, in the world. Uh, this slide shows uh, OECD countries. Actually, we do observe consistently with the literature um, the, the positive correlation, even after controlling from some factors between the, uh, let's say, the, the air quality and the and quality. So that there's, there is this correlation and uh, air quality is uh, an, asp an important aspect on the environment that uh, cities in OECD countries have to, to deal with. For example, um, we see, according to our estimates, that um, air quality improved in practically all OECD countries, all OECD uh, area, but there are still at least, uh, in, in almost all countries, there is at least one city with the uh, average of uh, PM2.5 above the recommended level. So it is, it's an issue that, uh, especially in cities and not in, uh, in other areas, is, uh, is important and should, um, sh should be tackled. And as I said, it is connected with the, with the health outcomes uh, End of the day. So uh, after this uh, introduction on the health, let me go a little bit through the uh, the economic uh, the economic part. So what what we do we know about uh, uh, regional economic disparities and what consideration could we make uh, related also to the, the current times that we that we see? Uh, the health crisis turned into an economic recession, as we, as we all know. Um, how this will translate in, uh, in in changing regional disparities? We are not able to assess. We don't have of course, data on, uh, on uh, say, different regional impacts, uh, direct impact, uh, don't have sufficiently new data and up-to-date, but we can make some assumptions, some considerations that I, I, I'm, I'm just doing now, uh, starting by putting this into context. So first, what do we know about a bit long-term regional disparities, regional economic disparities in, in OECD countries? Do we know? First of all, it, it depends on at what scale we are observing regional disparities. As regional scientists, probably you are all very, very familiar with the, with the, the importance of looking at the right scale uh, and the, the units of measures. If we take our uh, two types of regions, we have the large region and the small regions, uh, we have slightly uh, different results, I would say. Uh, if you look at these differences in GDP per capita, taking the whole OECD area as a, as a single set of, um, as a single uh, geographical area, so therefore we pull all uh, subnational regions and we look at differences and evolution of differences in GDP per capita using a TIL index for GDP per capita. Uh, we, um, the, let's say, decompose the steel index in between countries and within country. We see by looking at the large regions that uh, regional disparities, total regional disparities have uh, declined actually up to the global financial crisis during the last two decades. And then they have pretty much stagnated, uh, they have been constant. If you look instead at the more, the more granular perspective, at the tier three or NAS three regions, where we capture already the metropolitan areas and we capture some more uh, relevant aspects at the uh, spatial level, 
uh, we see that actually uh, regional disparities have started to increase, especially after uh, after the, the economic crisis. So after the global financial crisis of 2000, 2008, we observe a, a, a general trends toward uh, increased disparities. Now, um, if we if we would split instead, uh, if we would look at this country by country, then we have a simple fact, a simple. Uh, fact that highlights the heterogeneity of this phenomenon of regional disparities, that half of the countries have declined uh, disparities and half of the countries have uh, increased disparities uh, in, the, in, the, in the, this time frame. What instead is a common uh, pattern is, 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 is pretty uh, visible uh, across the OECD areas, is what I'm showing here is that um, if there is an increase in disparities, uh, this happens uh, in particular between uh, types of regions. So uh, in general, metropol in the last 10 years after the, the financial crisis, um, we see that the metropolitan regions and the regions close to metropolitan areas, the blue line that you see, uh, have evolved pretty much at the same pace, the GDP per capita, uh, while the, the non-metropolitan regions that are less accessible to less far away from metropolitan areas have actually declined. I've lost a little bit of uh, uh, GDP per capita compared to their metropolitan counterparts. Uh, so this is an uh, important uh, trend. So in this, in this context, in this framework, uh, how do the COVID, uh, uh, how does the COVID can impact in this, this general trends or can, uh, how to start thinking about the, 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 the importance of COVID. So one aspect we uh, took into account in this report was to look at uh, remote working. Remote working is uh, is uh, characterized this uh, this first wave of the actually this, this last year, uh, as you all know. Uh, we are I imagine we are all telework now uh, today for this uh, webinar. Um, what we did is we estimated the extent to which uh, regions were uh, are able are. Uh, are able to shift uh, to remote working depending on the type of occupations that are available in each region. So we reclassified all the occupations available uh, in the regions according to their degree of workability by relying on some works in the literature on this. And uh, what we found is that uh, we, we computed uh, individual region indicators on remote working. Uh, you see in the panel of the left, so how was the share of total jobs that can be uh, amenable to remote working was the show um, on the left panel. And you see that uh, most of the time is the capital regions uh, that have the highest value, the highest share of, uh, of uh, occupations that can be done remotely. Uh, instead, uh, on the right uh, panel, we did the same exercise by, by degree of urbanization. So by using a little bit more a granular perspective and distinguishing uh, three types of settlements, uh, so the cities, the towns and semi dense areas that are a bit intermediate density, and the rural areas, using the same definition, of course, so this is very comparable for European countries. And uh, we see that there are significant differences. Cities have more, uh, for in cities, the shift to the massive shift to remote working that has characterized the last year must have been uh, simpler, must be easier because uh, because of the, the simply the, the presence of occupation that are most amenable to remote working. 13 percentage points of difference between cities and rural areas on average. Uh, if uh, um, uh, remote working you know, is not the whole story, but I mean, in order to al allow for remote working, we need, of course, connection and capabilities. Uh, what about the skills of, of, of people? Uh, if you look at the share, really the, the minimum digital take up, so uh, using the internet, uh, even in this very simple, simple question, if you ask people are they using the internet or not, and the people that not, uh, who are not using the internet can be very high in specific countries and in specific regions of, uh, of some countries. But those regions that are more probably vulnerable to this type of crisis because it's hard to, uh, to shift to, to remote working if there is the lack of digital take up, minimum digital, digital take up. The other point, the third point is uh, the digital infrastructure. So uh, whether uh, connection is, um, is good enough to, to allow for, uh, for this new uh, functioning of the economy in these current times. Uh, here we see that uh, rural areas are facing still an important gap that they need to bridge in uh, several countries. In particular, uh, I mean, 
in, uh, in, uh, in one in three houses in rural areas uh, have no access to high speed broadband. By high speed here, for simplicity, we mean uh, internet connection with more than 30 megabits per second, which should be uh, fine for having video calls and, and, and all the different uh, type of interaction that, that we have. So there are rural areas that are um, still lagging behind in many places, and it's an important aspect to consider. And this, this for, for the economic, uh, some economic consideration, but uh, this also is combined with uh, some more uh, longer term, more long term demographic uh, uh, aspects, aspects of demographic change that are actually uh, taking place uh, across space in our OECD countries. So, um, first of all, I mean, uh, in the last is the concentration uh, of uh, population in the metropolitan. There is a trend ongoing, not only, I'm not talking about uh, global urbanization trends in, uh, in developing countries. Here I'm talking about developed countries with, where is practically stable, it's not declining, um, and where urbanization is already mature. But even in these countries, uh, we see that uh, if you look at the last two decades, uh, the, the share of population living in metropolitan regions have increased um, compared to the, the share of population in other types of regions. You see in the slide, the, the red dots are, are the, shows the, the, the change in the share of population in metropolitan regions, and the, the yellow dots are, uh, are the most remote regions. So you see that the yellow are mostly below zero, and, uh, and the, the red ones are uh, almost always above zero, with the exception of uh, uh, one country <laughs> in, all, in all the sample that we use. So, um, it is a slow process, of course. We are talking about a few percentage points, but it gives uh, the idea of the, the, on, the ongoing trends. So, um, connected to this, there is, of course, the point, of, uh, the point about uh, the aging of the population. And here, uh, again, uh, of course, uh, connected to the, to the previous point, I mean, aging is characterized the entire uh, population in OECD countries. is an increasingly important uh, aspect to consider, but in remote uh, regions, this is uh, more important, especially in the last few years. Just a final uh, uh, point on this uh, demographic change. This slide is uh, different from the previous ones. Uh, it, ref it refers to the, to, the, to the entire world. So here we were able to, uh, using our uh, definition of uh, cities and com their commuting zones called the functional urban areas that we developed together with the European Commission, we were able to look at the trends over time of uh, the functional urban areas uh, across the entire world. And this is just to highlight that the trends that concentration of people in cities in a, in a way is quite strong. Here we, we looked at uh, not just the difference between cities and non-cities or metropolitan area, regional non-metropolitan. Here we look at uh, only functional urban areas by their size. And we see that in the last uh, 45 uh, years, from 75 to 2020, we see that the, the, the cities will grow the fastest, we are the largest one, above 5 million in the entire world. And, uh, and this, according to projections that, that we have of population growth, will continue also in the last year. This, of course, doesn't take into account the COVID crisis and other, other megatrends, just, uh, in a sense, replicates what, uh, what we see. Paolo, there are 10 minutes remaining, okay? Yes, I uh, will do one time. Thanks, Andre, for reminding. Uh, last point to, um, to highlight is um, the, the, say the, the aspect of the other mega trends that is important to consider uh, are that related to climate change. On this, um, on this part, let me just um, show you uh, a few um, elements that we included in the presentation on on the impact, for example, of climate change and uh, looking at temperature, we estimated, we estimated that the change in cooling needs uh, in the long term. So uh, from the 70s to, to 2018, according to, to the data we had. And uh, the, I mean, the cooling needs, I mean, is, is, is a measure, is, is a, uh, using the cooling degree days, which is a standard measure to look at uh, the change in cooling needs, highlights that. Uh, there is even here there is quite quite an important place-based dimension. So I mean, uh, at city level, we, we estimated 
this uh, changing we need at the city level, functional urban area. And we see that uh, on average, there have been a uh, 25% increase since the 70s in the cooling needs. So it's quite a big uh, impact on that. And uh, some cities, specifically those who are in, uh, for example, in specific areas of Europe, like in the Mediterranean uh, uh, and in the coast, these are uh, those where the, the, the change was most noticeable according to our estimation, but also in other in other areas of the world, in Colombia, in, the, in, Colombia, in, uh, in, uh, in the US and Mexico, we see quite, uh, quite high change. Um, for climate change, uh, it's also important to look at deforestation. Deforestation is important also, uh, I mean, for many other aspects also of, uh, related to, to well-being. Here, um, what we see is that is the metropolitan areas and the largest metropolitan areas instead that are are experiences the, the highest loss in, uh, in tree cover, as expected, of course, as they are growing the most in terms of population, they are concentrating more population, but they are also, just to consider, they are also uh, losing uh, and they are account for most of the, of the loss in tree cover uh, in, in all the cities that, that we, uh, we consider. Um, then, uh, finally, on, the, on the, the climate change, it's important to, to, to look at the uh, at the transition towards uh, clean energy production. And here instead, if you want to look at the spatial gradient of this uh, transition, in particular, with one specific and narrow aspect, which can be the, the, the electricity production by source. Uh, electricity production is an important source of uh, CO2 emissions. And uh, if, we, if we look at uh, the, how many electricity, how much electricity is produced uh, in each type of regions on average in OECD countries, by source of, uh, of production. And we see that in this case, it's the remote regions that are, are, are doing low density places, remote, uh, far from metropolitan areas, we are doing uh, best in the sense they, pro they produce uh, uh, almost half of the, the total clean energy in OECD countries, even if they account for only 17% of the population. So they are, they are, they are much more uh, focused on sustainable uh, sources, their, um, their production of energy. Um, and the region far from metropolitan areas release about one third less uh, CO2 uh, per gigawatt hour than metropolitan regions. Um, this was just to, um, to conclude, I mean, just to, to, to have a summary. So we look at the health crisis, digitalization, climate change, urbanization, aging, uh, from, uh, let's say, uh, also important aspects from a perspective also of policymakers, I think an important aspects for regions and cities to be, uh, to adapt to the current uh, times, to the mega trends and to the health crisis. What is important is for sure, uh, digital infrastructures are well functioning, are something that is, is definitely worth considering. Um, the skilled labor force to, uh, to implement uh, the, uh, the, both the remote working and to be sure that the occupation that we perform can be can be done remotely in a digital world. And also, uh, of course, the, the capacity of places to, to ensure and to provide public services, especially close in proximity to the place of residence, and probably less importantly than before on uh, close to the place of work. Um, and then, of course, the, the importance of environmental quality. Uh, so these are a bit uh, the, the aspects that uh, I talked about here. Uh, just to finalize, um, you might uh, be interested in looking at the, the data at the regional and city level. We want also to use it for, for your research. We have a, an atlas and a statistic for most of the data that we showed here, and also uh, from the start links of the publication. And I close here. Thank you, Andrea. You are muted. Yes, you're right. <laughs> so thank you very much, Paolo, for this very comprehensive presentation. And now we come to the second part of the webinar. So this, this second part is devoted to the comments of our two uh, ERSA experts. And I start immediately with uh, Alessandra Fagian. So Alessandra is professor of applied economics and director of social 
Sciences and Deputy Rector at the Grand Sasso Science Institute, L'Aquila in Italy. And she's also past president of the North American Regional Science Council and co-editor of the Journal of Regional Science. And uh, her research interests lie in the fields of regional and urban economics, of course, and also demography, labor economics, and economics of education. And uh, her publications cover a wide range of topics, including migration, human capital, labor markets, creativity, local innovation, and growth. And last but not least, I have to tell that she has been awarded the prestigious 2020 ERSA Prize, which is attributed to the best regional scientist in Europe. So, Alessandra, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much. Now I feel the pressure because of your introduction and presentation. So while I'm actually pulling up my slides for the presentation, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, thank Paolo for uh, his uh, enlightening presentation. It was very clear. The report is very uh, important for us that are doing applied economics. The data that you are providing are fantastic. So it was a pleasure to discuss um, this report and your presentation because it was very interesting to, to read myself. I learned a lot from your presentation. Okay, given this uh, very brief introduction, I know I only have 10 minutes, so I can't really uh, talk uh, in a lot of details about uh, um, Sorry, I'm just trying to pull up the, uh, okay. Um, so I, all I'm doing is just uh, giving you a few random thoughts uh, uh, that came to my mind while I was actually reading Paolo's presentation and, and report. Uh, so it's about regional disparities, pretty much. Uh, I was thinking about uh, the rural versus urban issues. Uh, if you are wondering what these two pictures are, the one on the left is actually Tuscany. I think uh, a lot of you uh, know it. And the one on the right is actually Milan, uh, because that's where I was born. And so it's a skylight of a, a, a large urban area in Italy. All right, so I really like this uh, uh, picture, this figure that was in your presentation, Paul, and also in the report, in which you are basically highlighting five different dimensions that are driving uh, special disparities. And what I've been thinking uh, a lot in the last few months, um, it's exactly the role that COVID might have in uh, either uh, increasing or reducing these special disparities. It is true, and we all know, uh, as you highlighted in your presentation, that special disparities became an issue more within countries than rather uh, between countries. As we also know uh, that the role, uh, the, that the data play in terms of special dimensions, so these uh, uh, picking the right uh, uh, size and units to do uh, an analysis is fundamental because you get different results according to what kind of uh, data you are using. Anyway, so I was actually thinking, so uh, is there a role for COVID-19 to help with regional disparities. And here I'm saying helping because since I came back to Italy, my focus has been particularly the more peripheral areas. So uh, the, the, what we call in Italy, the inner areas. And uh, depending what it's your belief system, uh, you might think that actually reducing regional disparity might be good for a country. That's what I think. So when I'm thinking about COVID, I'm thinking, of course, of death and of problems, but I'm also thinking about opportunities uh, that might be there for more peripheral areas uh, and that might uh, be uh, used to kind of reduce a little bit regional disparities. So um, first of all, of course, COVID-19 affected all the previous factors that in turn are affecting regional disparities. We all know that, and that's why I think uh, Paolo uh, picked them and focused on them. In some cases, uh, nothing really changed, but uh, it accelerated. And so certain trends that were already mm -hmm. there, thanks to COVID, uh, uh, picked up speed. Uh, and I'll show you in a second what I'm talking about. In others, even though they didn't accelerate, at least they highlighted the crucial role of certain factors for the future. And the last thought is that there's going to be a lot of money poured into the system. 
this is not a period uh, in which uh, we are going to be past me this term stingy. This is a period in which now we are borrowing money to invest. And so it's incredibly important, and we all know that because everybody's talking about that, to decide the future direction of the different uh, uh, countries to pick and spend this money well and to have clear priorities. And personally, I believe that uh, reducing regional disparities should be one of these priorities. So let's start for, from your first dimension. So digitalization, I'm, I will go quickly. Eh? It's, it's not very long and three minutes already passed, but don't worry about that. So uh, digitalization was uh, uh, what really COVID affected and it made really clear the crucial law, role of digitalization for future development. So there's been an acceleration in digitalization, especially of rural areas. This was a, a real structural problem of the more peripheral areas, the areas that were lagging behind. Now it's absolutely clear that now more than before, digitalization is a precondition for future development. It's a necessary, or albeit not sufficient condition if we want to develop. But as Paolo highlighted, and I really care about this because I think it's very important, we're not just talking about infrastructure, we have to put in place uh, training so that we create uh, what Paolo uh, called uh, digital literacy or I call digital human capital. Uh, but in any case, we need to actually make sure that the people can use the infrastructure that we are providing them for. Uh, Paolo already mentioned this, uh, uh, I'm working of course on the case of Italy, as you can see the digitalization is especially a problem for rural areas. In Italy as of July 2020, so already past the first wave of COVID, there were over 6 million families that were without the internet and the larger percentage are in the south because there is this north-south divide in Italy, but also in municipalities that were below 2000 inhabitants, which means really, if we want to do something, let's digitalize these more peripheral areas uh, and probably regional disparities will benefit from it. In terms of urbanization, well, of course, COVID did not change as of yet, uh, the rate of urbanization of the different countries, but it made us ponder and wonder about uh, whether um, agglomerations effect um, always work or if there is some kind of vulnerability of our consolidated way of living. So on top there on the right, you see how urbanization was projected to go uh, to 2050, a few years ago. And now we're just change, we're just wondering if there are change in preference. Um, Will people start thinking that uh, living in uh, more dense uh, agglomeration is in fact more dangerous because of contagion from possible future pandemics? And so, you know, there is a possibility for rural areas. Here, uh, we actually studied the case of Italy and we looked at uh, the concentration of uh, sectors and activities in Italy. And uh, well, you probably know that the uh, pandemic in Italy started in a very uh, rich and uh, industrialized area, which is in the north. And so if you look at this map, you, you do look at, uh, uh, you do see the relationship between agglomeration and urbanization and the pandemics. So it's something that in the future, people might take into account. Uh, everybody thinks that, um, well, not everybody, but a lot of people are talking about uh, once the pandemic is gone, it's gone and whatever, we forget about it. Well, I don't think that's gonna be the case. First of all, because this pandemic has been long enough. And second, because now people are worried that it might happen again. There have been few of these uh, uh, illnesses going around even in the past. Uh, none of them reached the point of COVID, COVID, but now that it happened once, people are worried that this might be something that it's kind of repeating over time. And finally, uh, I'm not gonna talk about climate change. First of all, it's not really my area of expertise, but of course there is an obvious natural advantage in terms of climate for the peripheral areas and that might have help um, uh, with them. But I wanna talk about aging and health crisis. Uh, one thing that Paolo mentioned and, and, and I kind of talked about that uh, in the previous slide is that of course urbanization uh, is a problem for the contagion and for the spread of COVID. However, we often forget that uh, although peripheral areas were affected less, 
when they were affected, the effect overall was larger because uh, they have the higher percentage of older people. And also they don't have uh, such a good and developed health sanitary system. And so these are two other structural problems that are focal issues that we have to think about in the future in which there is no change yet, uh, aside from, of course, the fact that there, there have been a lot of people dying that were older in this region, but the, we, we are now going to receive a lot of money. We have to invest them in the hospital system in these peripheral areas if we want to change this. But it's not like digitalization. We haven't started the process yet. And here I just showed you that if you actually plot, these are the provinces in Italy, the mortality rate during the first wave of COVID and the percentage of population over 65, it's almost a straight line. If you actually do a regression uh, and you plot a straight line into these points, uh, you will get a very good fit because that is what happened. And we all know that peripheral areas have a much higher percentage of population 65 and over. So this is something we do have to invest money and think about in the future. So are there opportunities for, for peripheral areas? Yes, because finally there's going to be a large amount of money poured into the system. Well, of course, our uh, children will have to repay for it. But at, as of now, we will have the money to invest. There has been a possible change in preferences of people. So we don't know yet, but we know that some of them might think about, if not going to really inner areas, at least going more in intermediate places uh, and move a little bit further away from the centers. There are new possibilities because remote working is now more frequent and especially in services. And it's not going away because a lot of large companies are actually planning to implement a mixed kind of uh, uh, system. But, one thing I'm worried about is that I've heard a lot of debate uh, about uh, future cities and the cities that are dying. Well, I hope that the attention on the peripheries will be sustained in the future. So uh, I, I don't think cities are dying. Maybe they will have to kind of you know, reconvert a little bit. Something will have to be thought of. But this doesn't have to draw attention from the peripheries because the structural weaknesses did not disappear with COVID-19. So investments are necessary. Uh, and, you know, now we have money, let's make this investment. And then, of course, there will be a first mover advantage. I don't believe all the peripheries uh, uh, could or should be saved. Uh, the peripheries that will be able to react quicker than the others will, of course, have more chances of reap the benefit. And just to conclude, one example is this uh, pretty village, which is again in, in Tuscany on the mountain, Santa Fiora sul Monte Amiata. Uh, so they got the ultra fast bro broadband uh, during the, the, this uh, uh, crisis, during this period. And now they are advertising themselves as the first smart working village of Italy. So they're using this place branding, exploiting the fact that um, remote working in Italy increased from uh, half a million to eight million. And uh, to substantiate these, they're also offering monetary incentive subsidies. Of course, you can only use them in the short term, but they, they do help to uh, help people moving there to live uh, for at least two months. So basically they offer 50% uh, uh, of uh, the, the rental and a series of uh, small benefits for people to move in this smart working village of Italy. So these are kind of things we have to think about if we do want to uh, reduce regional disparities and help the peripheries uh, take advantage of the COVID opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alessandra. I think that you raise a lot of very important um, questions, especially regarding remote and rural areas. So probably we'll, we will come back to them. But now we go to the second um, uh, commentary, and it's uh, the one of uh, Liz Bourdeau-Lepage. So Liz is professor of geography at the University of Lyon and researcher at the CNRS Laboratory Environment, City and Society. She holds a PhD in economics and uh, her work takes a multidisciplinary look at the internal and external transformations of city and metropolises. And I have to say mainly in conjunction with the issue of uh, sustainable development. And she's currently interested in the place of nature in the city 
the measure of the individual's well-being, social, spatial equalities, and territorial attractiveness. And this year, she was named by the French media in the list of the 100 top people who make the city. And um, I have to say that lead, Liz also lead um, a, a work, a survey um, on well-being uh, on behalf of Versa, and probably a part of her speech will be around that. So Liz, it's your turn now. Yes, thank you very much, uh, André. Uh, you have to speak louder. Ah, OK. You don't. Yeah. Uh, OK. OK. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the uh, European Regional Science Association uh, for this invitation. And uh, uh, maybe my presentation uh, will. Um, will a little bit uh, uh, different uh, because I, I would like to take um, a step um, a step aside, as you can see. OK, did you see my presentation? It's OK? Um, yes. Yes, OK. You have to put it on full screen. OK, that's good. That's good? OK. Um, so uh, I, do, uh, I shall try to bring uh, don't, some reflection uh, to this debate on post-COVID world, well presented by Paolo Veneri and Alexandra Fagian, in the light of two surveys supported by European Regional Science Association conducted during the grand uh, lockdown in France in the Netherlands. First, we, sh we will show that uh, lockdown has, has uh, not affected all individuals in the same way. There are special disparities within countries. Then we will present one lesson that we can learn from this ongoing crisis for thinking the, the future of city and territories. At the end of the first week of lockdown in France, I launched a survey on three social networks, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. It was a self-administrated questionnaire. The aim of this survey was to record the changes that had taken in, the, in French people's day-to-day -day lives. And more specifically, to evaluate the lockdown impact on their well-being and their health. The sample was adjusted to be representative of the French metropolitan adulterium population in terms of gender, age, educational qualification, region of residence. The sample is to almost 11,000 individuals. The first uh, observation is that the well-being of French people is in a free fall during lockdown. The reported level of well-being decreased from 7.07 before lockdown to 5.6 during lockdown on the scale of 1 to um, 10, a decrease of 1.0. 47. Second observation, the drop in well-being levels doesn't affect all regions in the same way. Burgundy and Nouvelle-Aquitaine residents display the most important decrease of well-being, while Grand Est residents and Normandy residents the lowest. As you can see, the change in well-being doesn't present spatial autocorrelation. It is random. Second, uh, third observation. Lockdown has redistributed the regional card of well-being within the country. Before lockdown, such so, uh, a have the highest life satisfaction. The level of uh, well-being exhibits a strong positive spatial 
correlation. But during lockdown, Grand Est and Normandy residents have highest level of well-being. The level of well-being exhibit, exhibits a negative spatial autocorrelation. The region are on the share board. Okay, we can say most. We can see uh, what, uh, uh, what are the factors that affect the decrease uh, of the well-being, but I, I have no time to, ex to, uh, uh, to expose that now. Let's go uh, uh, um, on the revelation of the Netherlands survey. Uh, I also conducted a survey in the Netherlands. I did it with Evelyn van Leeuwen from the Va uh, Wageningen University. Uh, it is the same questionnaire as French. However, we, I did question about the level of urbanity of the respondents place of residence. So we can see if the impact of lockdown present rural urban differences. Our survey reveal that with the lockdown, the average level of well-being of the Dutch population of the Dutch people decreased from eight to six point seven. That is a drop of minus one point three. Before the long run, there there are no differences in the level of well-being between urban and rural residents. This is no longer the case during the lockdown. During the lockdown, differences are noticed between urban and rural areas. Thus. People are significantly uh, happier in the most rural areas. Our survey show also that during the lockdown, the health of Dutch people is deteriorated. In particular, cognitive capacities and physical condition. Thus, concentration problems, attention issue, irritability, fatigue and feeling of sadness have increased as much as uh, 35 to 42 percent of the respondents indicate that they experience this more often during the lockdown but the phenomena doesn't not affect anyone in the same way respondents in the urban areas and in the very urban areas report significantly more health problems than usual compared to respondents from the most uh, rural areas. Also, why urban people are usually less affected by uh, health problems in the e uh, OECD, the, uh, the trend is reversed in the Netherlands during lockdown. And now thinking about the future of city and territories in the line of this crisis is not, is, is not easy, but maybe we have some, some uh, idea or some suggestion. Uh, in our qu uh, questionnaire, three questions are relating to the period after lockdown. Do you think this period of lockdown will change where we take the environment into account and preserve it. Uh, you, as you can see, uh, 69.4% uh, in the French resp respondents uh, answer yes, and 41 uh, uh, Dutch uh, <laughs> respondents. So, uh, second question, do you think that this period of London will change the way we live uh, in France? Uh, most uh, that than 66% uh, per, uh, of the respondent response yes, and uh, around 66% in the Netherlands. Do you think the period of London will change the way we work? Yes, 
uh, in, in for uh, forty two point nine uh, percent of the French respondent and sixty six percent uh, of the uh, Dutch respondent. Ah, the great lockdown had several effects. First, uh, it has exas exacerbated the debate on the impact of human activities on the environment and the ecological imperative. Second, by revealing uh, some of the city's evils, noise, atmospheric and light pollution, urban and Iceland, socio social spatial inequalities is underlined the, the urgency to act. I've linked a, a strengthening of the demand for nature in the city and evidence of the benefits of plants on the health and well-being of city dwellers to combat environmental and virtual overloads. Third, the great lockdown has allowed allow the rediscovery of neighborhood life in the city. Thus, uh, in order to conclude, the lockdown has led to renewed reflection on how to develop cities by emphasizing the importance of considering the health of urban dwellers, preserving biodiversity and saving resources, designing the city with neighborhood life in mind. In a way, a new urban agenis uh, uh, is emerging and eco-urbanism has accepted itself. Based on the French and Dutch experiences, one lesson can be learned from this ongoing crisis for thinking the future of city and territories, putting people's well-being at the heart of public policy. Thank you very much, Lise. So uh, there were two very interesting uh, comments. Now we can go to the um, comments of the attendees, but Paolo, maybe you want to make a few comments about, about this, if you wish. Well, um, why not? <laughs> I just, um, uh, well, on regarding Alessandra, uh, pretty much everything, everything she said, I think is pretty much in line with, with uh, with also what I presented, so I, I I fully agree also on the on the I mean, considering other lens when it comes to the impact of COVID, including the the aging of the population. I mean I mean it's true that uh, in the first wave we observed uh, metropolitan regions that were most hit by the crisis, but actually we know that the the the, the share of all the people is is a, correlates positively with the with the excess mortality. So that that was an impact. I mean, the, the trends I presented on the metropolitan regions most hit by the, the crisis, it was for the first wave. Uh, we have to check whether this is also true for the, for the subsequent waves. Uh, actually, from uh, very preliminary uh, observations in some countries, in OECD countries, like in the US, this does not seem to be the case anymore. Uh, so we have, I mean, this is one of the factors, but aging is, uh, is an important one. Uh, the importance of uh, digital skills, I think uh, I, I fully agree. I mean, for uh, in, in the framework of regional disparities, I mean, not only internet connection is important, it's, it's something very important still, but it must be combined with, uh, with reflecting on the skills of the population and also on uh, to also to link with what uh, uh, probably Liz was, uh, was presenting, uh, also must be connected to creating the conditions for Mm, for, for generating I mean, a good, a good life and also opportunities uh, for, uh, for work. Uh, just a minor thing on, on, um, on one slide, because uh, Liz in her presentation uh, showed the one uh, piece of evidence from our 
cities in the world report where cities have um, less reported health problems compared to rural areas and this is not consistent with the, the evidence she got for the Netherlands but uh, that is not a finding for uh, OECD countries what we documented that's a finding that uh, across most of the entire world uh, which means and is driven primarily by developing countries where actually it is true that people living in cities uh, tend to have uh, less uh, uh, self-reported health problems. If we focus only on developed countries like Europe, OECD, etc., probably we don't find the same. So that's the explanation of the discrepancy. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Paolo. Now we turn to the questions in the Q&R and in the chat. So there was a first question quite earlier during the start of your speech, Paolo, and it's about the question is, hello, some more urbanized areas are more vulnerable in terms of COVID and other possible epidemies in the future? Are there more vulnerable in the future? The question is about the possible vulnerability. Yeah, OK. Uh, it's, it's hard to answer in the sense of vulnerability in, in, what, in health, from the health perspective. We, we don't know. I mean, we don't know the answer. I mean, that's my <laughs> humble <laughs> answer. Unfortunately, uh, we need to to check it. We know, as I said, from the from the health point of view, where we have kind of exposed the data in a sense uh, post crisis. Yes, we saw that in the first wave, uh, the large cities were most hit. Uh, but uh, we need to check. We have to do further research, also to look at the subsequent periods to see whether there is a consistent pattern. There are some heavy, uh, research done already on the, on the excess mortality, on the drivers of excess mortality. There is the paper by Andres Rodriguez Pose, uh, Chiara Bullinato, that was produced, which, which document also some other correlations with, uh, with, with other regional characteristics. But it's hard to say now for me. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put my, my uh, my sign in, a, in a w whether actually metropolitan areas are more vulnerable to the crisis and current and future. This, uh, there are too many aspects that, to consider. Yeah, that's my <laughs> non-answer, sorry. Okay, there is another question also for you, because it went for Paolo Veneri, and it's yeah. about the role of the institutions in the, in the COVID uh, pandemic, and especially uh, regarding the spatial inequalities you, you pointed out. Yes, uh, this actually links to to the to the paper I mentioned by Andres Rodriguez Pose. Is one of, uh, is, is a paper which documents a, a correlation between quality of institutions and excess mortality. Uh, um, so it, there's been evidence on that. So institutions, yes, mentioned. We didn't cover it in uh, in our reports too. Um, also because we have not yet a measure that covers in the whole set of OECD countries on this institutional quality. We, very much like to do to have it so in that case i would have talked about that but yes the quality of institution is important uh, but uh, i think that uh, there are still to be to understand whether there are place-based factors that in a sense are, are associated to uh, to i mean to this evidence on on resilience in a sense, health resilience to the to the crisis um, what I mean, we, we, we show some characteristics. Uh, air quality is one of those that also em emerged from the literature and also from uh, our own data to be correlated with excess mortality, but hard to establish a causal relationship. Okay. Thanks. Good. I think that the third question is probably for Liz, because the question is, um, how did you ensure the representativeness of the data at the regional and territorial level in the absence of a sampling design and by conducting the survey online. So you had a lot of observation, but how, how did you ensure the representativeness of your data? Yes, my, uh, for, for French, for the French case, uh, we, the sample was uh, adjusted to be representative of the French metropolitan adulterum population. Uh, but uh, this, don't, don't, uh, for the France, the, we, we don't have a, a problem with that. And it was uh, uh, maybe we, we, we would like to have um, 
uh, cities and uh, and uh, rural areas, but it was not uh, possible. And we have only region of residents because we have some uh, uh, some uh, some uh, lacked uh, data um, data uh, was. Uh, uh, was not uh, completed and uh, it was only possible to do uh, that for a region of residents. And uh, for, uh, for the Dutch uh, case, uh, we, we did, uh, didn't uh, yet uh, um, ad uh, adjust uh, the sample, but the, our respondents uh, uh, come from all over the Netherlands, all provinces are well represented, and the distribution between urban and rural areas is representative. Uh, but uh, uh, um, uh, I think it will be uh, uh, very uh, uh, well uh, to, to adjust uh, the, the Dutch uh, samples. Um, Yes, that was the question. Is it okay? Okay, okay, thank you, Liz. I think there is a question, probably it's more for Alessandra. It's a question of Daniela Constantine. And it's my question refers to urbanization patterns. How will they be influenced by the COVID 19 crisis in terms of the downtown suburbs relationship, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the mobility flows and patterns? Mm -hmm. So uh, there are a few questions that are all, I think, linked to this one. Uh, so I'll tell you what I think it's going to happen. First of all, I don't think the effects are just going to be temporary. I think that there are going to be some of them more permanent. And so there's going to be a change in preferences. I do believe, and this goes back to also to the question of Ilaria, that uh, the intermediate area will benefit. In some regions, we already had some patterns of suburbanizations. Now, where we have uh, more services and where we have works that jobs that will be done remotely, at least in part, I think that we might observe the radius of the commuting becoming a little bit larger. So just, I don't think it's just gonna be suburban areas. Maybe there might be a place for more intermediate really areas going even a little bit further than uh, suburban areas. Um, and then what was this uh, rural urban relationship, Andres? Andre? Um, I can about see the question, that. yeah, downtown suburbs relationship, mobility flows and patterns. Yeah, uh, I believe that the mobility might become less frequent and longer. So uh, the, the goes back to what I was saying. I think that if anything, there will be more of a, a role for uh, intermediate area. And of course it does depend uh, on accessibility, that's for sure. But uh, I, I, I do believe that they're gonna move. If you have to commute less frequently, you will move further away. And I believe this might happen if people believe that uh, the pandemics might reoccur in the future, then it's not gonna be temporary. And the way we see that with the rise of peri-urban location, where people accept now to live quite far away from the center of the city where they work, for example, given the fact that they hope to go only two or three times per week to work, so they accept to, to have more, more uh, close mobility, I, I will say. So there are other uh, questions about um, relation between rural, and uh, urban areas as well. There is also a question, and, and it's about the question of the broadband. So the question is, I'd like to ask if given a proper broadband connection in peripheral or inner areas, what might be the main development trends for small villages to become as attractive as metropolitan area? That's a very difficult question, but maybe one of you three who wants to try to bring it response i actually know valeria and because she works in my group and i know that she works on culture so i'm just wondering first of all i do believe that uh, saying you know beside healthcare transport and education systems i actually believe that if we were to provide good schools 
to kids, a lot of maybe young family will be more willing to move there. And that would, you know, I know you say beside healthcare, transport and education system, but I think that if we start from these three, we would already be in a very good place to make the peripheral areas more attractive than what they are now. In terms of making them exactly like uh, um, attractive, like urban places that might never happen, but of course, you could think about the role of culture in this, in the sense that one typical urbanization economy is, you know, going to a cinema, going to all these entertainment things, and there might be a role in peripheral areas for this as well. And pa Paolo, did you see any correlation in, uh, let's say, in less uh, urbanized areas with the level of um, uh, possibilities of connection and the inequalities of the, the attempt to COVID? Um, not uh, well. No, I mean we we haven't looked in from that perspective, at, from that lens, at that uh, topic. But uh, to I mean, as I said, what we see is a clear uh, digital gap uh, uh, on average uh, for uh, rural areas. So to make attractive uh, rural areas, I mean, it's, the point I don't think is to make them as attractive as metropolitan uh, areas because it will be attractive for different types of uh, people, different types of agents, but at least to make it, to make them viable, so an option. I mean, then according to preferences, uh, people will, uh, will choose the location, but I mean, if already they provide, these areas provide the minimum uh, uh, necessary uh, let's say digital infrastructure services to the extent possible, and uh, like Alessandra mentioned, for example, schools or but also health services, etc. Then they are viable for the people. Uh, there are viable places to live uh, from for more people. Uh, otherwise, we have, they will have a disadvantage. And of course, there is a question of how much. What is the cost of providing all these services when there is not enough density, not enough people? And that is, of course, also to have to take into consideration. Uh, so, need to to find ways that are efficient, or that are optimal to 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 try to find the, the right balance, the right trade-off. So, uh, I think I saw a, a, a question. I don't know whether um, maybe before, maybe it was partially or already answered on the permanent versus. Uh, um, structural versus uh, temporary effects of the COVID. Um, yeah. There is also a question from uh, Ilaria Mariotti, and it's about the differences completely on the reverse way. It's regarding to the di uh, differences between the big cities. For example, she took the example, she said maybe we can uh, hypothesize that it will be rather different in, uh, in uh, London and in, uh, Mi in Milan, because of the, the, I, okay. <laughs> Oh, well, on, on that question by Ilaria, I think if if I understand it well, uh, there was a point on the yes, the difference between cities, but whether suburban areas were gaining from the COVID and from the remote working pattern. Um, well, my view on this is that, I mean, uh, we don't know yet uh, for sure, but we, I think we have arguments to think that uh, suburban areas are so in areas that are still in close proximity to the services uh, and to the to the import of the agglomerations that they can commute. Uh, so perhaps with the remote working options that in my opinion, at least to some extent, they will stay even after the COVID, they will stay, I mean, the remote working will be a more accepted option, let's say, than in the past. So that we need to consider. So uh, even if it will not be as, as, uh, as widespread as now, because we are forced to do that, but I think uh, part of it will stay. So, and if it stays, uh, you could expect that uh, the, the, the type of commuting will change and commuting to work will have a different pattern, different, uh, different frequency. And if there is a lower frequency, there will be probably, there will be larger, longer. And so the commuting zones of uh, the largest agglomerations will be, will, could be, I mean, uh, larger. Uh, that means that the suburban areas could, uh, could have been, uh, could benefit from that. I mean, that's, I think uh, we have, we have important reasons to think that that's, that could happen. I saw the last statistics for the Ile-de-France region. Maybe it was last week. And there is a and there is, they pointed a raise in the prices of uh, houses in the suburban areas, maybe related to that, and which is something which is uh, quite new. So maybe, yes, Liz, you have things to say about that, and especially 
maybe around the question of the desire for nature. Yes, yes. Uh, we can see uh, in France there is a debate in the city and uh, about uh, medium sized cities. And uh, because uh, price, uh, prices uh, are increasing, and um, we, we, I, I would like to say two things. The first, that is a medium-sized city with a good offer of services uh, and uh, well connected could uh, become attractive, and she, they, um, they, uh, they are becoming attractive. Uh, but uh, uh, um, a large part of medium-sized cities uh, uh, are not uh, attractive. Uh, and uh, this is the first point. And uh, because uh, uh, the medium-sized cities are more attractive, uh, are close um, uh, to uh, the cost. Normandy, for example, in Normandy, or uh, where, where there are uh, natural amenities. And the second point uh, I would like to, to say is that uh, this question uh, uh, for me uh, is uh, pertinent uh, for only, um, only um, uh, a little part of the population because um, uh, is it possible to change uh, the uh, the, resi the residence uh, lo location, if you can uh, uh, work at home, but uh, all uh, all uh, all the French population of the Parisian population uh, um, cannot uh, ca uh, cannot uh, work at home, and I think this is a debate for. Uh, uh, <laughs> for a part and uh, um, um, for people with a good level of, li uh, of, um, uh, of uh, life because there are qualification, income is okay and so on. And uh, I think it will be interesting that uh, we think about uh, uh, um, uh, the part of the population uh, with more, with uh, less uh, money, uh, because uh, uh, they, 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 they are in the city and uh, urban uh, areas, very urban areas, and they suffer of uh, of the of the um, um, no good condition of life and the quality of life is not uh, very good. And uh, for me, the most important question is to, to, to change something uh, in our uh, uh, big cities uh, before uh, thinking about uh, other cities or other periphery. Because the people in the big cities uh, um, develop or um, uh, change their, their preferences. They know now they, they, that, that the nature is, uh, is very important for their, their well-being and their health. And, uh, I th uh, and it is why I, I, uh, this is explain my conclusion of my, my mini presentation. We, we, we have to, to think uh, our uh, uh, cities and territories uh, with uh, citizens and uh, with dwellers, sorry. Urban dwellers. Okay, yes. thank you very much, Liz. There is a question which is really related to your speech. So that's the question of Dimitri Korpakis. And he was, he said that he is surprised to see that the economic dimension, dimension like uh, trade or CBD was not mentioned in the diagram of the OECD. And he's also uh, claiming about the, the, the fact that maybe the basic, the basic message for the future is the need for more green spaces in the cities, as well as a new model of urban dwellings and so on and so on. So, okay, you already, already responded about this, but I, I would like to ask 
also of a question to Paolo and to uh, Alessandra as well. So maybe Paolo, you can start about uh, this surprise, this somehow surprise. Oh yes, the, the, the importance of trade for regional disparities is, is of course important. Uh, actually, in the report we have a, we have a section on uh, dedicated to regional disparities uh, and to to change in uh, in uh, trade flows in a sense between uh, regions. It doesn't cover, of course, the the post crisis uh, because, it, unfortunately, we don't. We would like to have uh, such uh, an updating information. We don't have yet, so we are now just reflecting on the basis of previous trends and uh, what we could be reasonable uh, to to do. So, yes, it was not included in this in this presentation, but uh, for sure it is a, an important aspect. And I fully agree also with Lisa with the, this uh, question that you just read, Andrea, on uh, yeah, the importance on, of uh, green space, of amenities, on um, quality within the city. I mean, uh, at, at the margin, at least, it will be uh, important for cities in uh, even a post-COVID uh, post uh, world I mean, to ensure a good, uh, good quality of life, a good, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a world where remote working, for example, is more, uh, is more widespread. I mean, this, I think that probably cities that will uh, will be able to offer good um, open air parks, uh, green space within the city. I mean, we'll, we'll have an advantage over the others that uh, that will don't have, we won't have that uh, that that amenities. I mean, th those amenities. So I think this, I agree with that uh, that view overall. Alessandro, do you want to elaborate on this? For example, I saw yesterday. That, uh, uh, regarding soft mobilities in the city, that uh, the total investment in the European countries is not about 1 billion euros regarding bicycles uh, lanes. So, okay. So, first of all, I want to say that for me, the best, the basic message for the future uh, is uh, more about peripheries rather than cities. I always go back to this because I'm so worried, and I said that in my presentation, that now we are moving towards you know caring and being worried about the cities and we forget that the peripheries did not suddenly become richer because of covid and i go back to the vulnerability vulnerability in terms of people that died yes the cities were affected most but the economic crisis that is coming it's going to affect more the peripheral areas where we have fewer services we had fewer jobs and we are not going to go to remote working people are poor so for me when i hear about okay give me one basic message for the future is let's not all forget that the peripheries will have even more problems now. And it's not like suddenly COVID made the peripheries attractive and we are all good in the peripheries. Okay, so that is my first point. Going to the cities, which for me is the second priority if I have to pick one, okay. So in the cities, of course, if you talk about quality of life rather than talking about income, uh, well, Liz was saying this, right? The quality of life might be higher in rural areas. They're poorer, but they have more amenities. And so in the cities, they're richer, but maybe they have a poor quality of life. And so, of course, it would be great to have a cycle path, to have green areas, to make the city more livable, for sure. Yeah, so let's invest the money in a wise way in which we actually think about maybe both of them, but we don't now forget about the peripheries and think just about the problems of the cities. Okay, thank you very much. So there is one last question. My proposition is I, I will ask you this question and step one by one, you can make your response and we'll finish by Paolo uh, about this. So we'll start by uh, Liz this time. So the question is about a possible shift um, of paradigm in public policy for cities uh, and regions. The question is um, uh, from a liberal like model based on an intercity interregion competition to one in which there is more room for Keynesian like state interventionism and in which, okay, there will be more or less regional inequalities between uh, different places. So, um, okay, Liz, you can, if you want, elaborate on that, and then it will be also your final message. Oh, Mike. 
<laughs> I don't know if I want to elaborate with, on okay. that, but I, 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 I can say that I am uh, I'm uh, agree with uh, uh, with Alexandra. I think we have uh, two messages. The first one is not forget the poor population in the cities and uh, the premier de corvée, <laughs> voilà. uh, and not forget the uh, isolated rural areas because uh, the, 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 the level of the public services of uh, um, infrastructure equipment uh, are, are very poor and uh, it is um, uh, a big uh, a big problem for the population and for the economic development okay thank you very much alessandra something more if you want I would be very quick, quick. Hugo, my answer to this is we are advocating for this and we wish that they were taking the regional disparities as the core point of intervention. Are we observing a change? Mm, at the moment, not yet. Let's hope with this recovery fund and all the money that is pouring in, regional disparities are taken seriously into account because now there is more money. So we want to see investment in reducing regional disparities, but I, I, we wish, I don't know. Okay, Paolo, you can have the last yes, word no, just on, this or on everything you want. No, 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 I mean, just on this last question, I mean, I, of course, we don't know, I don't, I, I don't know yet, I mean, if there is a policy change, but we will see in the future. Uh, for now, I think it's important to try to understand uh, what is going on and so that we can inform policy, policy makers. Of course, I think regional disparities are uh, we, we documented uh, regional disparities and the, the, uh, what we document is regional disparities when they are increasing is because it's the peripheral areas who are suffering more. So if there is something, if we want to tackle regional disparities, we have to think about those places first, of course. Uh, then um, if the question is about regional disparities and other questions were, okay, what's the future of cities for the COVID? That's another different question. But that, then, of course, uh, if ever, I mean, we don't know what's the real uh, effect the post uh, yet about the, the, the health crisis on the regional disparities. It depends on the dimension, depends on many things. Uh, but, uh, but I think that in general, I mean, if, ever, if we have some arguments, I would, I would tend to think that the regional disparities might even increase, given the between, uh, let's say, more urban and less uh, and less uh, and more remote uh, places. So, uh, regional disparities might remain an important, actually even increasing importance uh, for the future by policymakers. That's that's my <laughs> conclusion. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So, thank you. I think now we're close to the end of this uh, webinar. So, I want to thank you all of you for your presentation. I want also to thank. Uh, the OECD for the, 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 the agreement and also I want and the partnership. Also want to thank all the, attend, the attendees for the questions. And uh, of course you can contact the, the, the presenters by different ways in order if you have some insatisfactions about your questions or their responses. So please do not forget to follow our, all the activities uh, of ERSA. Uh, you can follow us on our social media, also on our website. And please do not uh, forget to look at uh, all the videos in our uh, YouTube channel, and especially the, the, the videos of the presentation of today will be put in a few, um, in a small time on our channel. So thank you very much. Bye-bye and have a nice evening. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>